Hey guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Tamar Meisels and today we're going to take a deep dive into an extremely heated topic here in Israel and that is the drafting of the Haredim ultra-Orthodox into the Israeli army. So basically Israel has a mandatory army service for all Israelis at the age of 18 and this community, this Haredi community, about 90% of them do not join the army. In this video, we're going to talk about why they don't join the army. We're going to get into some of the history behind that. And we're going to talk about some possible solutions, how we can solve this conflict in Israel. This is the second episode in the series. In the last episode, we talked about who this ultra-Orthodox Haredi group is, and we spoke a lot about their history and background. So basically this all started in the time of the War of Independence of Israel when Ben Gurion and the rabbis reached an agreement where they will give an exemption to 400 yeshiva students who Torah to umanuto, which means students where Torah learning is their full-time apparatus, they're doing this full-time. Ben Gurion explained his rationale that because the yeshiva world and the Torah world was very much destroyed in the Holocaust, Israel was the only country where yeshivas remained, and 400 students was a small amount of students to give this exemption to. But basically, what started happening over time was that this number, 400, kept growing and growing every year, and the percentage of the Haredim out of the entire Israeli population kept growing and growing. And even Ben Gurion didn't realize the magnitude that this exemption was gonna get to. In 1958, he wrote a letter to the chief rabbi at the time, Rav Herzog, and he said, over the years, the number of yeshiva students grew. We are Jews, our security is dependent on us. Very great moral question if it is worthy that one mother's son should die defending our homeland and another mother sits and he learns safely in his room when most of the young Israelis are risking their lives. The courts did set up some sort of limit on the yearly exemptions given, but in 1977, when the right rose to power, this changed completely. In order to form a coalition with the Haredi parties, basically the agreement was that there would be no more any yearly limit on the number of exemptions given. As you can imagine, as this number began to increase and the percentage of 18-year-old Haredim out of the entire population increased, this arose a very strong public opposition to what was going on here. רק הילדים שלנו יתגייסו לצבא, רק הילדים שלנו יתנו שלוש שנים, רק הילדים שלנו יסכנו את חייהם. In 2013, a new star arises, Yair Lapid, and he promises his voters that he's going to take care of this shivyon banetel, which means equality in the burden. People are feeling that it's not fair that we have all the burden, and he got a lot of seats, he got 19, uh, seats in that uh, coalition. They form a law in 2014 that talks about a certain number of draftees that needs to be reached. There's targets that need to be reached. And if these targets are not met, then you can start placing economic sanctions on the yeshivot who are not supplying the students. And even criminal charges can be against uh, yeshiva students that are not being drafted. Following this law, they held a huge rally, about 600,000 Haredi men and yeshiva students from all types of the ultra-Orthodox Haredi community rally against this law. And they talk about not giving into the temptation of going into the army, even if you need to face criminal charges, you will not join the army. A Knesset member, Litzman, said at the time, this law is the destruction of Torah in Israel. Whoever thinks that with sanctions and decrees they will surrender Torah learners is wrong. Have him look at our history. The opposite is true. So in 2020, we learned that the army was presenting wrong numbers and these thresholds were actually not being met at all. So this means, according to the law, you can start placing criminal charges and sanctions against people. Vigdor Lieberman insisted that we start having sanctions against these yeshiva bachers who are not being drafted into the army. Haredi parties claimed, how can you have sanctions against someone who chooses to learn Torah? 
They, so they couldn't agree and 2019 this was the reason that the government fell and this is one of the main reasons that we had four consecutive elections where Lieberman and the Haredi parties could not reach an agreement on this matter. Basically we had a political crisis where the right couldn't form a government for a few years. Let's try to understand it on the Haredi perspective. If we were to ask a uh, Haredi why don't you serve in the army? What would be some of the answers they would give us? First answer they'd give is what protects the world and what protects the state of Israel more? A soldier or a Torah learner? So in their opinion, a soldier may give physical protection, but the Torah learner is actually giving spiritual protection to the nation. So they do believe in something called pikuach nefesh, which means saving your life. If we're at a situation where your life is at risk, then they would join the army or they would defend themselves. When you're needed to defend yourself against enemies, in Jewish law, this is called milchemet mitzvah. But what is the status of our current wars? Are we defending ourselves against it? Are we? Um, so according to my rabbis, yes, we are definitely in a situation where we're defending ourselves against many enemies and it's a mitzvah and an obligation to join the army. But their rabbis don't feel the same way. Another thing that they'll say a lot of times is that the army has enough people. The army has an influx of people. The army doesn't need me. So is this true? Uh, does the IDF, Israeli Defense Army, does the army even want them? So not really. The IDF doesn't really want them. It's very complicated for them and very expensive for them. Basically, those who do join the army, the army has to very much adapt to them. They have to make sure that there's like no women in the zone. They have to make sure that there's a uh, very strict kashrut that they hold by. Also, social benefits that the army provides. Someone who's coming into the, when he's already married or has kids, there's a lot of benefits that they get. So the army doesn't really want them. It is very complicated and very expensive to draft them. But the main reason is really that the culture in the army is secular and they are afraid to join it. I explained more about this in the first episode, but basically the Haredi community is very sheltered from the world. And they're very much afraid that sending young people who are so sheltered into the army to be integrated will very much harm them morally and spiritually. Also females, like we said, are also in the army and Haredim are very strict about mingling between the sexes. And also there is some truth to their fears because Ben Gurion, when forming the army, he wanted the army to also be some sort of education system and a melting pot. He said, we want to form ties and bonds to define one nation. We are to form an army with a new Jewish culture. We want to educate people. This is exactly what Haredim don't want. They don't want an education system. They don't want to be part of this melting pot. They want to be uh, segregated and with their own culture. But to be perfectly honest, even if the army were set up for them, which is really difficult, and it was 100% kosher, separate units for men, and kosher was perfect, they still wouldn't want to go. And the real reason is because over time it became ingrained in their lifestyle not to join the army. Over the years, it became ingrained in their culture to view the army as a place where young people are spiritually and morally hurt and they sort of demonize the army, the way they look at it. So in their culture, going to the army is really not a good thing and it's, it could even be a shameful thing. So their norm does not allow them to join the army regardless if the army were set up for them and did set up 100% kosher and they would not be given any commandment that would be against the Torah, they still culturally really wouldn't want to join the army. And What's a little bit sad is that instead of them teaching their young people how important Sahel is and what a mitzvah it is, they're really, they kind of disregard it. Okay, so we can't ignore the general economic perspective. And what this means is that when we talk about netel, a burden, we're talking about the security burden, netel bitroni, and also netel kalkali, the economic burden. So basically, they don't, they get an exemption from the army as long as they're Torah learners and they did form a Torah learning society where they learn Torah 
for many years, even at the expense of you know, living in poverty. Even those who do work, work in low paying jobs. So basically in Israel's you know, socialized democracy, there are very high taxes and these taxes are mostly being paid by high wage jobs. So really there's a lot of resentment, not only because they don't join the army, but also because when it comes to the economic burden, they are either not working or working in low paid jobs. So they're really enjoying a lot of the socialized uh, benefits given to poor people. You know, they're given uh, money for their kids. They have more kids than the rest of society. They're using all of Israel's uh, benefits, but when it comes to adding to, um, but when it comes to helping Israel economically by paying taxes, they're not really participating. Only 51% of Haredi men work compared to 86% of men that are non-Haredi. And even those who do work, like we said, and even those who do work, work in low paid jobs. So they're not really adding much money to the state because of their higher birth rate and their political power and voting power. They're able to secure their interests. And this causes a lot of resentment towards them by the Israeli public. So let's talk about some possible solutions to this problem. Basically, some people are saying, okay, we lost the battle of them joining the army. That's not going to happen. Let's at least enable them and make it easier for them to be part of the workforce. At least they could help with the economics of the country because basically when they sign the exemption, Torah to umanuto, they can delay, they can continue to delay their army draft only as long as they're full-time learners, meaning they cannot go work, they cannot go learn, they have to wait until the clock runs out. When does the clock run out? So basically this used to be around age 40, 50, but over time it's been lowered and in 2014 it became the age of 24. And 24, a Haredi man is usually married with two kids and it's not easy to join the workforce and, um, you know, we'll talk more in the next episode about their education system, but they didn't learn a lot of secular education. So at 24, it's hard for them to join the workforce. If we lower it even further in 2021, there's talk about moving in 2021. There's been talk uh, till now about lowering their age to 21, al allowing them at age 21 to join the workforce and to learn and do what they need, that would help the economics much better. So 21 is sort of the fair age because at that age, their secular peers are leaving the army, finishing the army. So it's not like they're getting a start earlier than their counter peers. We can't know exactly for sure how many, but many analysts say that lowering the age where they could go work will lead more of them to work at younger ages. And the most radical would be to even let them off the hook entirely at age 18. And at least we can hopefully gain some from the economic burden. Why is there such strong opposition to age 21? to let them off the hook because basically you're admitting um, inequality. You're giving something to a certain group of people that the other people just don't get that benefit. How will this admitting to inequality affect the motivation of those who are joining the army and don't have a choice? I said to a friend of mine at work, maybe we could just, you know, be smart and let them off the hook of the army. Don't place them in the cage, let them go work. And then at least we could be smart and gain them in the economic sphere. He said to me, what about the three years that I did? No one asked me if I wanted to do them. Another idea that seems kind of logical is to make Israel into a professional army where army service is not obligatory. We're not the army of the nation like we've been since the declaration of independence. So, you know, a lot of Haredim support this and a lot of armies in the West did move to a professional army like the US in 1973. Most Israelis don't like this solution because they worry that doing this will jeopardize the quality of the army. You know, we need the best people we can have. You know, Israel is in a jungle of the Middle East. We have a lot of enemies and we really need the best people we could get. And if we don't have obligatory service and, you know, you have to 
choose to go to the army, then maybe we won't be able to provide the same quality of army. Also, you know, this melting pot and mixing up, um, you know, groups of people that happens in the armies. We have seculars and religious and people from all walks of life really, you know, becoming great friends and making great ties. This is something that, you know, a lot of Israelis think is important and they don't want to give up on. So a lot of people say, okay, maybe they don't want to join the army, but why not national service? Why not giving two years, three years to the state, you know, in some organization, in some capacity of national service? And I asked my friend at work who's an ex Haredi, and I asked him, why don't they join national service? And he said, they won't give up two years in a years that are so important to the formation of their young people. These are years that they are in yeshiva, they're still forming themselves before they start their families and start their life, and they will not give up two, three years you know, to yeshiva. While they do volunteer a lot, and studies show that the Haredi population volunteer their time much more than other sectors, they cannot do it in the form of giving up two, three years of those critical years and giving it to a national service. It's something that they just won't do. So hope this video helped you understand a little bit more about Haredim in the Israeli army, reasons why they don't join, some of the history behind it. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and I love to hear your comments below. Bye, see you next time.